anybody who's ever prescribed a statin to people knows there's a very small amount, and it's even in the package insert, that comes back and tells, Doc, since you started this, I'm not right. I'm not thinking right. I'm not calculating right. My brain is in a fog. And we use the word brain fog. Again, an extreme minority of people given statins have that. We had no clue what caused that. Invariably, would stop the statin, try another one. It usually occurred. Or if it didn't, fine. But if not, then we'd have to figure out other ways to uh, lower LDL cholesterol, which was not easy years ago. But anyway, my hypothesis nowadays is these small number of people who get brain fog, I wish I had desmosterol levels on them, could some people be very sensitive to the effects of a statin? We know in the periphery, hypersynthesizers of cholesterol respond incredibly well with statins. So, uh, or excuse me, oversynthesizers do, hyposynthesizers do not. So who knows? But that, if that being said, now, here comes the next part of that epidemiologic study where they correlated low desmosterol with serum desmosterol. People who had low serum desmosterol had a much higher incidence of cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, which would lead simply to the hypothesis that serum desmosterol is a usable biomarker to say, is somebody at risk for Alzheimer's disease? And this goes back to when uh, I met Richard Isaacson with Peter. We started throwing these hypotheses around, and we've watched that ever since. Where would it come into play? So if we're, and you know, until recently, statins were our only game in town. So if we write a statin, especially if used at a higher dose, if desmostrol was dropping low, and we use an arbitrary cutoff point, the 20th percentile, would that be, maybe you don't want to inhibit cholesterol synthesis in the brain to that degree. Might we want to attack ApoB with another agent? All hypothetical uh, reasons I'm putting on the table here right now. And I think right now we look at that, especially in who? Who are the people that we know are likely prone to uh, dementia and cognitive impairment? The E4 carriers, people maybe with strong family histories, people that have other identifiable traits that, may, traits that make us think they're prone to AD. We would watch desmosterol incredibly closely in that population. So now the last thing I'll tell you, if the astrocyte is not making cholesterol because of its being oversuppressed by a statin, the neuron would be getting less cholesterol the neuron would convert none of that cholesterol to 24-S-hydroxy cholesterol because it's trying to conserve every cholesterol molecule it can. So I think if you were somebody who could measure 24-S-hydroxy cholesterol in the serum, you would not see it in somebody who had cholesterol synthesis suppression in the brain. This all has to be worked out in future clinical trials, but there, there are looking at this in some clinical trials right now. So one day we'll be a lot smarter on this. Right now, if you want, you could measure desmosterol and perhaps use that as a cautionary marker. Number one, if they're not on a drug and it's low, you might, if you haven't done an ApoE4 genotype, you might look at it. Uh, but if it is somebody who has a propensity to desmosterol and you have to use a statin, maybe you want to watch that. The good news is, and I think it's why our mantra is if we have to use a statin, we start with low-dose statins. We have very little use for the high-dose statin in the year 2024 because none of the other ApoB-lowering drugs, be it bempedoic acid, azetamide, certainly PCSK9 inhibitors, get into the brain and suppress cholesterol synthesis. So we have many ways of lowering ApoB if we were a little fearful of low desmosterol in a patient prone to AD or so. So that's about as much as we want to get into probably with brain lipids right now. And understand ApoE is a big player up there, and there are different types of the ApoE protein. But understand cholesterol homeostasis has a lot to do with what is in the peripheral cells. We can look at markers of synthesis. The markers of cholesterol absorption that we use big time when evaluating peripheral cholesterol homeostasis obviously is not at play in the brain. The brain is not absorbing cholesterol from your gut. Before we leave that, Tom, um, what is our hypothesis around the hydrophobicity um, of various statins? And do we think that certain statins are more likely 
to cross the blood brain barrier? <clears throat> Are there certain statins that should be ignored in patients with marginal desmosterol? Great question, and the thoughts have changed on this too. Because early on, if you go back, probably maybe even listen to the podcast you and I did in 2018, I believe, we were talking about hydrophilic and lipophilic statins, and the lipophilic ones can pass right through the barrier a little easier than the hydrophilic one, which need receptors to pull them in. But uh, subsequent analyses has shown all statins get into the brain ultimately once you have a steady state statin level in the blood they all will get into your brain and they all have the ability to suppress cholesterol synthesis in the brain. Now, the last thing I want to say about statins before everybody says, oh my God, I'm stopping my statin tomorrow. I can't get a desmosterol level. Well, they're available if you look for them. But in general, if you analyze all of the statin data, the many trials, be they observational or randomized control, there is no signal whatsoever that in a population statins uh, worsen or cause cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. There's a few studies that even suggest perhaps some lowering. Maybe that's through atherosclerotic cerebral vascular disease. Who knows? But don't worry that statins in the overwhelming vast majority of people are not hurting the brain. But I think we've introduced perhaps a biomarker that you might know with a little more certainty if you have to write a statin in somebody subject to dementia. Yeah, um, we actually covered this at length in one of the previous uh, AMAs, and I went through every meta-analysis on this topic. It's important for people to understand that at least at the time, and I don't think this has changed, there has been not been any statin trial where the primary outcome was dementia. Right. Uh, the primary trial is always cardiovascular disease, but there have been more than a dozen such trials where the secondary outcomes are dementia. It's worth noting that in every one of those trials, regardless of statin used, there has either been no change in the risk of dementia or a reduction in the risk of dementia. Now, it's interesting, these studies were almost all done in the setting of trying to determine if lipophilic versus hydrophilic statins were more, less, or better. And the answer always emerged, it didn't seem to matter, which of course makes sense if you understand now that they probably all cross the blood-brain barrier. So the question remains, will there ever be a study done that tests this question specifically as the primary outcome? In other words, where the study is powered to ask the question, does the use of a statin increase, decrease, or have no effect on the risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Or will we instead be forced to rely on these secondary outcomes, which are always subject to some potential misinterpretation. Again, I take much more comfort in knowing that they are all either neutral or favorable. That would certainly be better than the opposite. Uh, but again, that remains uh, a bit of an unknown. And, and you might be right, Tom, it might be that <clears throat> on average, it's having no effect on the brain. On average, it's having a beneficial effect through the vascular system. But then there might be edge cases that are not being captured in large clinical trials based on hundreds of thousands of people. Correct. And it might, in fact, be those patients in whom a little extra knowledge goes a long way vis-a-vis -vis cholesterol synthesis in the brain. And the final point I'll make here is what a privilege it is to be practicing medicine in 2024 when we don't have only statins, but we have ezetimibe, we have bempedoic acid, we have short-acting PCSK9 inhibitors, we now have long-acting PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, we have a ASOs around the corner. Uh, there really is no need for a patient to ever endure a side effect of lipid-lowering medication today. We can we can lower everybody's lipids without side effects, uh, and and so that's that's you know that's and that's only going to become more and more true in the next decade. Couldn't argue with anything you said there. It's brilliant what you said, and also this is not a reason not to use statins. You individually, we're not evaluating populations. We treat people one at a time. So in somebody we're worried about dementia, we have a biomarker that's probably usable. And if God, you can't take the statin, so what? We can get your ApoB goal pretty easily with the other things that we know are not affecting the brain. 
What Peter said, wouldn't it be nice to have a randomized blinded trial to answer this question? All statins are generic. I don't know of any pharma company that's going to spend a billion dollars to prove or disprove what statins do to uh, cognitive uh, functions of the brain. So it's not going to happen. So if it's not, we can use in individual patients these oddball biomarkers that is what I think is part of medicine 3.0, where we maybe use a little smarter uh, knowledge to try and do a better job. The last thing I'm going to, and Peter has harped this enough too, we can, I, maybe I badmouth high dose stands. We don't use them. We're not treating acute coronary syndrome patients where maybe you want to be on a high dose statin for X amount of time. You can get most of the ApoB lowering with a statin with the baby dose. This has been proven in trial after trial. Most of the LDL receptor upregulation occurs with the lowest dose that inhibits cholesterol synthesis. You start doubling, tripling, quadrupling, you might get another 6 7%, not the original 30% lowering or so. So in today's world, why do you ever have to double, triple, or quadruple the dose of a statin uh, when we have all these other additive drugs that you take a baby statin, my uh, sort of acronym for a low-dose statin, and you combine it with a zetamide, bempedoic acid, or PCSK9 inhibitor, you've got a... Uh, a military machine that can destroy ApoB. So that should be the thought processes about attacking ApoB nowadays. We have so many options, which we didn't have in the heyday. I always say one last thing, because I'm old enough to remember, where did all this hydrophilic, lipophilic stuff come from? The first two competitive statins on the market were Simvastatin, which was Merck's most potent statin, more potent than their Lovastatin or Mevacor. So everybody jumped on Zilcor or Simvastatin. But Bristol-Myers Squibb made Pravastatin, hydrophilic. And there was a lot of thought looking at other biomarkers that the, and even catabolism that the hydrophilic statins were safer than the others. Was there a little more brain fog with Mevacor or Zilcor than there was with Pravacol? Anecdotally, people said that. I never saw a trial that looked at that. So, But that's where it all came from, pharma competitiveness, hydrophilic versus a lipophilic statin.